A few years ago, I was in my neighborhood's community garden. Surrounding the garden on three sides is a chicken run. When I went to check on my plot, I found that someone had left the gate, separating the garden and the chickens open, and a chicken had gotten into the garden. The chicken was picking at and eating bits of things from various people's plots, so it was obvious I could not leave without somehow returning the chicken to her run. I loved the chickens, but I was not one of their regular caretakers and was not adept at catching or, in fact, picking up and carrying a squirming chicken. Needless to say, a half-hour-long chase ensued. I would just get close enough to pick her up, and she would quickly run in another direction. I became very frustrated and decided to take a different tack. I swear this really happened. I opened the gate to the chicken area, and I told the chicken, this is what I want you to do. I want you to walk straight along the garden path. When you reach the turn that leads to the gate, I want you to make a right and head into your run. The chicken did exactly what I told her to do. Turning back to me, just as she was entering her pen, she gave me a look that said, finally, all you had to do was ask. And I closed the gate. David Fleming defines encounter in his book Lean Logic as the act of recognizing something, a person, a practice, a system, on its own terms. To acknowledge the wholeness of a system, a woodland, a person, an animal, a planet, nature, means being aware that you are in the presence of something which has business and an agenda of its own and which cannot be tamed by your understanding. My encounter with the chicken at the outset was simply me trying to control the chicken, who indeed had an agenda of her own. The garden was in all of its fullness, and she had just discovered a smorgasbord. When I decided to encounter her as a being with her own agency, she responded. How often do we encounter the non-human other with the intent of trying to control rather than with the intent of encounter, with the intent of listening? We celebrate when we get apes to use American Sign Language to communicate. We know that our dogs have acquired human vocabulary when they can retrieve for us exactly the toy we have asked for. We know our cats understand what we are asking of them, even if they refuse to comply. When is the last time we celebrated because a human suddenly learned the language of apes or elephants or dolphins? We know these particular animals have language of their own. We are just not smart enough to learn it. Yet we know some of them learn ours. Who is more intelligent in this scenario? Just asking. In his book, A Reenchanted World, James Gibson looks at the way in which humanity, particularly in the West, in the modern period, began to characterize non-human, and to a certain extent human, nature in mechanistic terms, so that animals were simply unfeeling machines incapable of emotions or pain. As the accomplishments of science earned it increasing prestige, this purely utilitarian view of nature became the dominant mode. The subjection was so complete, it virtually eclipsed humankind's past, and with it, the traditional unity between humans and the rest of creation typical of pre-modern societies. Gibson points out, however, that there are always pods of resistance to this way of thinking. He points to people who have had encounters, in the sense I defined above, with non-human beings. From naturalist Alan Tennant, who bonded with the peregrine falcon Amelia, to nature writer Dan O'Brien's encounter with a bison, to Paul Watson's encounters with whales, Humans are again beginning to understand the complex relationship between humans and the non-human world 
that goes beyond the utilitarian. One of the most famous encounters that became a seminal essay for the environmental movement was Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain in his book, The Sand County Almanac, in which he told about his shifting relationship to the non-human world. He described his encounter with a wolf he had just shot. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and the mountain. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Leopold watched what happened to the mountain when the wolves were eliminated. The deer, with no predators, decimated the foliage. He wrote, I now suspect that just as a deer herd lives in fear of its wolves, so too does the mountain live in mortal fear of its deer. Leopold went on to create what he called a land ethic, that is, what he considered good land conservation practices that took into account the whole of an ecosystem. What if we took seriously that the more than human world speaks to us? What if the trees had language? What if rivers had language? What if mountains had language? What if I told you they do? In Derek Jensen's book, A Language Older Than Words, he tells of a conversation he had with his friend Jeanette Armstrong, a Native American author, teacher, and philosopher. Jeanette said, attitudes about interspecies communication are the primary difference between Western and indigenous philosophies. Even the most progressive Western philosophers still generally believe that listening to the land is a metaphor. She paused, then continued emphatically, it is not a metaphor, it is how the world is. Jensen then goes on to recount hearing of a Dine, Navajo man, say that uranium gives people radiation poisoning because uranium does not like to be above the ground. It wants to remain far beneath the surface of the earth. Scientists are discovering that trees communicate with other trees, that plants communicate among themselves and between themselves and other plants. I recently read about communication in forests. Trees of all different species communicate with each other through mycorrhizal networks underground. There are trees older, more established trees that scientists call mother trees that support the growth of the younger saplings. If a mother tree is cut down, the chances that younger seedlings will not survive goes up. If a mother tree dies naturally, however, they slowly transfer their nutrients as they are dying to the younger trees. Trees of different species share nutrients as each needs. Trees, concluded scientist Susan Simard, who discovered this, talk. Trees are part of an interconnected network that runs through whole forests between and among species. She calls the forest system super cooperators. This, of course, goes against the human conception of survival of the fittest, the idea that individual species are in competition with other species. A concept, I believe, humans have projected onto the natural world because they needed a rationalization for their own worldview. Environmentalist Derek Jensen, in his book, A Myth of Human Supremacy, talks about other scientists who have discovered communication between plant species in which it appears that different species of plants protect each other against predators. 
Instead of being amazed at the cooperation, instead of being stunned by these acts of generosity, the scientists who made this discovery asked only, why should one plant waste energy cluing in its competitors about danger? A question which Jensen answers for them, because plants are smart enough to understand that they're not the only creatures on the planet and that their very survival requires the well-being of all these others. Plants in a redwood forest, for example, understand that a redwood forest consists of more than just redwoods. It consists of alders and cedars and firs and ferns and fungi and bears and otters and salmon and caddisflies. How we encounter the non-human other affects how we understand our world. For some, the discovery of plant communication simply means a way of securing insider knowledge for human gain. If certain plants can protect each other against predators, we can use that to increase plant yields for our own purposes. If we know that trees communicate, we can more efficiently cut down forests. But I argue that the non-human world is not simply a supply of eggs in the case of my chicken or the potential board feet of lumber in the case of the forests. It is there not simply as a human resource base. It is sacred in its own right. If we but understand that we are part of this interconnected web of all existence, we might stop thinking that the fittest means the domination and destruction of all others for our benefit. We, humans, seem to be the only ones who don't understand that that very destruction is our own destruction. So go out into the real world, not the real world of work and finance, but the real world that supports us. Encounter a plant or plants, encounter a chicken, Encounter a forest and see them in their own terms. Listen carefully and quietly to what they have to teach us. I think it is the only way we can save the world. Amen.